My next guest was a founding member of Greenpeace, but he left the organization when it abandoned science and logic for scare tactics and sensationalism. I want you to welcome the author of an absolutely incredible book, and I mean this sincerely. If you have any interest in the whole issue of climate change and science, I recommend this. It's called Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. This gentleman is also a champion of sensible environmentalism. Dr. Patrick Moore. Dr. Moore, welcome. Thank you for being here. Your book is riveting, and, and in part because it's a very balanced and fair approach to looking at what's happening to our planet, what's, uh, what's our fault, and what's not our fault, and what we need to do about it. I, I, first of all, let me mention this. You have a PhD in ecology, so it's not like you're just a political activist. You're a scientist by training with a PhD in looking at this. We hear today that the science is settled when it comes to the climate. Is it, is it that settled? Well, it's really not right even to say the science. And they talk about now climate science and climate scientists. And these are trick words being used because what they really mean when they say climate science is someone who agrees with what I think. And when they say climate scientists, they mean someone who agrees with all of the narrative about CO2 causing global warming and it's catastrophic and all of that whole narrative. And anyone who doesn't agree with them is not a climate scientist, but rather a climate denier. Yeah. And that is to conjure up the Holocaust and to make us look like we're evil. So it's a very serious division in terms of using words uh, and propaganda to make it seem as though, you know, they say there's an overwhelming consensus of climate scientists who agree with this narrative of catastrophic global warming. Consensus has no place in science. Consensus is a political word. It's a legitimate word, like in a democracy, you're looking for a majority, and that is a consensus. But that's about policy. That's not about facts. Facts and science are not about a majority. If you look back to Galileo or Darwin or Mendel or Einstein, they all had to fight sometimes for decades, even till they died, against a false consensus in order to get the truth out about what was really happening in this world of ours, in all these different subjects that they studied and, and, and told us what was true. Dr. Moore, one of the things that I most appreciated, it's not that you have abandoned your love of the planet, your appreciation for the need to take better care of it, but you want to do it rationally, sensibly, in a way that does not destroy the very earth in which we live and the businesses and all the other. At what point did you feel like Greenpeace as an organization had kind, and I, you use the term in your book, you didn't leave Greenpeace, it left you. Yes, it's true in that I grew up in nature on, on, a, on a floating village in a isolated I inlet up, up on the north coast of Vancouver Island with no road to it. So I grew up innately loving nature, being in it my whole childhood. Then I went into life science in school and ended up in a PhD in ecology before that word was known to the general public in the late 1960s. So I followed that through my whole life. And when I joined Greenpeace, it was to help save the world from all out nuclear war and then to save the whales from extinction and to stop toxic waste going into the rivers and into the air. These were what I thought were the most important things I could be doing at that time for the environment. And then it, it gradually changed. The peace kind of dropped off Greenpeace, the peace being about people, the, the green being about the environment. And suddenly my fellow Greenpeacers and the rest of the movement began to describe humans as the enemies of nature, mm -hmm. as if there were too many of us and actually we were, were kind of a bad species to begin with, as if we were the only evil species and all the other species were good. And I just could not accept that because I know we come from life just like all the other species do. We're all part of nature. And the first lesson of ecology is in fact, we're all one system here on this earth, all interconnected with each other. The other thing that I, that I really had to leave because of was that my fellow directors, in the end, none of whom had any formal science education like I did, decided that the common denominator was chlorine as a toxic and we should ban it worldwide. I tried to remind them, not only is it one of the elements in the periodic table, which is kind of hard to be banning uh, that. that I'm like banning air that or chlorine something. Was, and, <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and even though elemental chlorine is quite toxic, when you combine it with other elements, it becomes one of the most important substances for public health and medicine. And adding chlorine to drinking water was the biggest example in the history of public health and to our spas and pools to prevent communicable diseases. And about 85% of our synthetic pharmaceuticals, our medicines, are made with chlorine chemistry precisely because it is toxic to bacteria that are trying to kill us. Mm. So I, I could not get anywhere with my fellows because they just didn't understand the chemistry. And whereas you don't have to be a PhD physicist to want to ban nuclear weapons, or even a PhD marine scientist to want to save the whales, that those are pretty obvious. But when it comes to chemicals and toxics and molecules and the whole subject of toxicology, in, in fact, you do have to have some training in chemistry and biology to understand it, and they, and they didn't. I want to go through several things that we hear about all the time. Uh, there are things that you mention in your book, and some are so new that the book needs to come back out again and, and let everybody see it. You mentioned chlorine. Let's use the term New Green Deal. Good deal? Bad deal? No deal at all? Well, it's just a slogan, I guess, at the very best. Uh, the New Green Deal basically says that we have to completely eliminate fossil fuels from our whole society. And whereas there are lots of things that we could do to change our pattern of energy consumption, I mean, fossil fuels are about 85% of global energy, and the same for the United States. The, the, the other two most important ones are nuclear energy and hydroelectric energy. The wind and solar, even though they've spent trillions on it with massive subsidies, is still less than 1% of global energy. Mm. And there is no possible way that it is ever going to become a mainstream source of power. First, because it's intermittent. Second, because it's expensive. So we do have to look at, at the mix we have. We've got natural gas, petroleum, and coal. And we have hydroelectric energy, which is only available in certain places, like here in Tennessee, for mm -hmm. example. And we've got nuclear, which is, can be used any, everywhere in the world. And that's the one that's been wrongly neglected to date. And one day will be seen as one of the most important sources of energy because the fossil fuels will eventually become scarcer. It may, it may now be three, 400 years because of all the new technologies we have for extracting them and finding them. But in the end, for example, all commercial shipping should be nuclear because mm. you've got the Russian icebreaker fleet is all nuclear and four countries have nuclear navies, aircraft carriers and submarines. It's easy to power large ships with nuclear propulsion. So that would save a lot of oil. And the same thing is true of electrifying the railroads. This can be done with nuclear energy. And so there's lots of ways that we can use nuclear to replace uh, fossil fuels. But the so-called green movement is adamantly opposed to nuclear energy and, in fact, to hydroelectric energy, which are the two main technologies that could actually replace fossil fuels for certain uses. You know, when I hear people say we only have 12 years left and then we're all done anyway, and if we don't get rid of all fossil fuels in 12 years, we're going to be extinct. And I'm thinking, how do you replace all the airplanes and the cars? I mean, I'm th I fly a lot because I travel all the time. And solar panels on an airplane may be a great idea, but I would never want to fly at night ever again. I mean, uh, it doesn't look good. I, did, I can't imagine that being very healthy. But the, the other thing we hear so much about, Dr. Uh, Moore, is the idea that um, the carbon footprint that we're making is unsustainable and it's gonna raise the global temperature and we're gonna burn up polar capsule melt 40 years ago, when I was in college, what I remember being told was, in 10 years, we were all gonna freeze to death and global cooling was going to turn us into human popsicles. So which is it? Are we getting too cold, getting too hot? Or does the earth have the capacity to adjust anyway? Well, it's, it's difficult for people to understand because there's cycles upon cycles and some of them are short and some of them are long and they don't all mesh together perfectly. So it's very chaotic the climate of the earth and has been for all the billions of years it's been here. But the main point to know is because this is all blamed on carbon dioxide mm. and they love to call it carbon, even though carbon dioxide is not soot. It is an invisible gas that is necessary for life. As a matter of fact, it is the building block of all life. 
all the carbon in carbon-based life, which is you and I and every other living thing on the planet, comes from carbon dioxide either in the air or in the sea. It's, it's dissolved in the sea from the air. It all came originally from volcanic action when the Earth was much hotter than it is today, but it's not being replenished at the same rate that it was then, so has in fact been declining steadily for the last 150 million years. And the truth is, if we hadn't come along and put some of it back in the atmosphere from where it came, you see, all the carbon dioxide that's being emitted by our burning fossil fuels, they're made with plants hmm. and plankton in the sea. They are 100% solar created from sunshine in the first place. And they were the result of carbon dioxide and water being combined into sugars, which powers the whole of life on Earth. So carbon dioxide is, in fact, the building block, the very essence of life. That's where all the carbon is from. And putting some of it back into the atmosphere where it came from is not a sin. It is, in fact, a very useful thing to be doing as it is resulting in the greening of this entire planet because carbon dioxide had become so low, and this is, it's almost like humorous, that they have made it seem that there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere when it's been declining for actually 500 million years, the last 150 million, down to levels that very recently were almost low enough to kill the plants. Why don't we hear more scientists say what you just said? I mean, it seems like that there's a, a chorus and they all say the same thing, that we're, we're going to die because of CO2. Many other scientists believe what I'm saying. And it, I, the first time I gave this lecture on the decline of CO2 and the fact that we are life's salvation by putting some of it back into the atmosphere and greening the Earth was in October of 2015 in London with the Global Warming Policy Foundation as the key speaker. No one has refuted my presentation. It's in video, it's in print, it's in peer-reviewed scientific papers and has not been refuted by a single person. And I've asked people to please tell me what's wrong with this theory. You should be me. You don't have to ask people to tell you what's wrong with what you say. <laughs> they do it all automatically. So, <laughs> don't ever go into politics, Dr. Moore. It, it's, it's a very dangerous zone. Well, they just haven't <laughs> been able to come up with anything. And I know, actually, that I am right on this point. And I just wish more people would listen to what I would call genuine scientists like yourself. You have a phrase that you, you speak of in the book that I thought was very powerful because I, it's the most balanced approach, sustainable environmentalism. So describe what that means, sustainable environment. Well, the, the problem is, is this whole term sustainable has been used by both extremes now, to, and it discredits the word. It's very difficult when words get misused to, to, to get people to understand the meaning that they were supposed to have when they were invented. The term sustainable development was invented in Nairobi in 1982 at a conference of environmentalists. Hmm as a compromise between the environmentalists in the industrial world and the environmentalists in the developing world. You can't be against development in the developing world. Yeah. And so sustainable development was this compromise, which the, the people from the developed world said, okay, we'll, we'll use this word sustainable to describe development that is good, that doesn't harm the environment. And it, it, like nothing is sustainable forever. The sun is going to burn out apparently in four and a half billion years. But for our sake <laughs> today and for the next few decades, yeah. sustainable simply means will continue to last for a long time at the present rate of use. Now, it, these are, it's really interesting because renewable, you'd think, oh, well, renewable, everything renewable is sustainable. Not if you overfish it, it isn't. Mm. Not if you overcut it, it isn't. And some things that are non-renewable are very sustainable, like iron ore, for example. There's enough iron ore in the Earth's crust to last for a trillion years. Hmm. So people have to learn these words, and they're all in my book, described more clearly than they are in the, in the media, which distorts words left and right. So, well, it's one of the reasons that I found your book absolutely fascinating. You, you made a statement, and then I'm going to close with this. It says, simple science made me a Greenpeace dropout. I think for people who say, we've got to get back to the science, more than any book I've seen, this book is one that if people are really interested in getting back to the scientists, they ought to read one written by a scientist, not a politician. It is called Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. Dr. Pat McMoore, thank you so much for bringing some very genuine and cool rationality 
to the often overheated subject of climate change. And to read Dr. Moore's latest articles or to invite him as a speaker, get his book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout. His website is echosense.me. That's echosense.me.